On today's show, are we overreacting to the Mavericks' four losses recently and the fact that Jason Kidd should be out as the Dallas Mavericks coach? We'll talk about that and more in today's Locked on Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked on Mavericks. Welcome to the Mavericks! NBA champion. He can't buy it! He can't buy it! It's good! And the Mavericks have won the game! Thank you, Mr. Mavericks! If you don't believe, you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. Welcome, you are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show. Make Locked On Mavs your first listen today where the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day, leave a five-star review, like the video, and comment anything below. Let me know in the comment section, what do you think the Mavericks record will be to end the season? 21 games left, 21. 21 games left, 21. Let me know what you think. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 150 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Today on the show, the Mavericks have found a starting five. They've got a real starting five. So we'll talk about that. What's working with that five-man unit? How? Why did it take so long for the Mavericks to find one? We'll get into that. I'll answer some of your questions. I'm answering a bunch of questions today on subtext. I did a mailbag with all the subtexters, so you can text the number that's coming up on the screen right there or text the number in the description. It's the same number. I just want, I just want you to know that. It's the same number. Text the number. Click the, the link in the description. I send bonus content out there. I answered a bunch more mailbag questions I won't be able to get on this show today. So I'm answering those questions. And I want to start with this one right here. Do you think the Mavs fan base, and this person wrote, including yourself, I appreciated that. <laughs> Do you think the Mavs fan base, including yourself, are overreacting to the most recent couple of losses? It's an interesting question because if you look at what the Mavericks have done this season, or if you look at what the Mavericks have done recently, they go on the seven-game win streak. We're feeling real good. The trades happen right in the middle of the seven-game win streak, and we like we keep letting it ride, right? I mean, it's literally the definition of let it ride. It keeps going. They make the trades. Keeps going four more. You know, they win three in a row. Okay, feeling good at the all-star break, or at least feeling better than you were before. And then they make the trades. All right, awesome. Four more wins. All right, we're letting it ride. Let it ride to the night. And then they lose to Indiana. And you're like, ah, I don't feel good about that one. And then the Cleveland game happens. And then till the fourth quarter, you're like, okay, maybe they're back. And then Max Struess hits seven threes. Don Mitchell hits seven threes. They hit 15 threes in the fourth quarter, or, or, you know, seven of nine in the fourth quarter. Max Struess hits a 60-foot bomb that is almost completely, literally unprecedented to lose a game. And they lose that one. It's like, oh, dang it. They win against Toronto. You're like, okay. Then they get destroyed by the Celtics in the fourth quarter. They, They stick with them for most of the game, but then lose in the fourth quarter. And then they lose a game they're not supposed to lose to the Sixers. No Embiid. Maxi was hurt in the middle of it. Just some weird stuff happened. And so you lose that game you're not supposed to. And so then you add it all up and you go, all right, well, the Mavs have lost the last four out of five. And they're in the Western Conference. The standings right now are so tough. They're so close. But you know what else? The Mavs lost four out of five and they're still in eighth place. (laughs) At least they had that cushion. So are we overreacting to it? Here's what I have to say about that. It depends on what you think we're reacting to. I think a lot of time, You hear something, you know, you hear me talk a lot. If you listen to this show, if you're part of the Raccoon Squad, you listen every day. You hear me talk a lot about the Mavericks. But even you in the Raccoon Squad, even you, daily listener, even you, asker of this question that subscribes to subtext, you're like even more locked in than than a daily listener necessarily is. I don't think you knew what I was reacting to with the Mavericks losses. What do you think I'm reacting to? Because I think if you're asking the question, are we overreacting to the losses? The purpose of your question is, where did you think that they were going to be? And then where do you think they are now? And I think that's a good question to ask where the Mavericks are right now. Because coming out of the All-Star break, in those trades, four four wins after that, seven wins in a row, feeling really good. All of a sudden, okay, is this Mavericks team like, all right, are we like, what are we talking about here? And so I think that's what we have to figure out. So for me, this is where I was with, with, with the team. Going into the All-Star break, I was feeling really bad. <laughs> I was not feeling good about this team. I was feeling like, okay, we're going before the trades. I'll say, I'll put it that way. Before the trades, I was like, man, this team will just be lucky to make the playoffs because of the way that they're playing, the, the injuries, all that. It just was not adding up. 
I was not feeling good about them. And then the trades happen and you go, okay, I think this team has a chance to make the playoffs, meaning to get to fifth and sixth, to make the playoffs, and then to win a first round series, which again is like kind of the ceiling that you thought that this Mavericks team would have at the beginning of the season. You make these trades and I think it solidifies them. I don't think the trades moved their ceiling at all, at all. It helped their floor for sure. Those are floor, those are floor trades, not ceiling trades, and the Mavericks needed to raise their floor for sure. And so I felt better about where the Mavericks were was supposed to be and where they were going to be. And you lose some of these games, you go, man, it just reminds you that there are still some issues with this team. That even bringing in these, these new guys, that there are still some problems. It's going to take a while for the defense. We talk about that with every single player. I felt like we talked about it with Christian Wood for like 365 days in a row. <laughs> that it's going to take a while for them to learn the defensive system or to, or to get there because it takes coordination. It takes communicating and even some of the Mavericks guys that have been there for a while watch Tim Hardaway Jr. on defense he's even still not communicating or in the right place or all that and you're just like man can we just figure this out maybe it's a scheme problem we'll get to that in a second but it's gonna take them a little bit to just gel with everybody get that chemistry and all that we're at about we're at nine games now we're at nine games so I don't know maybe we should be on the threshold of, of that actually happening and them figuring it out. I think they're now comfortable in their roles, but it does take it does take a little used to getting used to to figure out how to play offense around Luka Doncic. And then the defense takes a little while because of the scheme and because of the switching and rotating and that's why we've been talking about you've heard slightly, you've heard Reggie, you've heard Dana, you've heard several people on this show besides myself even say the Mavs just look behind on a lot of their defensive rotations and a lot of their defensive assignments. It looks like they're they're just trying to play catch up. They're running around in a circle. Yeah, it's because it takes them a while to figure out, all right, you got to be there, you got to be there, you got to be there, and also react to what the offense is doing at the same time. And defense right now in the NBA is just impossible. I mean, it just really is. It's, you look at you look around the league right now, like there's only one. Is <laughs> Are the Timberwolves even there? No, they're not even there. Timberwolves... Best defense in the league, 108.1 points allowed per 100 possessions. That means like a top 10 defense. Yeah, right. Phoenix is, yeah, no, they're 13. Okay, top 10 defense. <laughs> there are three top 10 defense. I'll put it this way. There are three top 10 defenses allowing 114 points per 100 possessions. Do you remember the Mavericks team a couple years ago where we were like, they have the best offense in NBA history? That team, that team scored 116 points per hundred possessions. That was like the best offense in NBA history at the time. And now 114 points per hundred possessions allowed is a top 10 defense in the league. That's how impossible defense has become. So the Mavericks are, you know, one, dealing with some of the issues that they have. Personnel still. You got a rookie center. You've got two, you know, really uh, isolation heavy guards that don't, that put work in on the defensive end, I'll say that, but are not known for their defense and are not like going to uh, make any defensive teams or anything like that. And you don't want them to have to do so much work on the defensive end because you want them to be, you know, have that heavy load on offense. You've got an, a brand new wing that's coming in that's never played on a winning team in PJ Washington. You've got Josh Green, who's, you know, 23 and still trying to find his way in the NBA, I think. And so, like, it's, that's tough to try and figure out. And so are we overreacting to what the Mavericks, the loss of the Mavericks have had? Maybe. It depends on where you thought they were. I think where they are right now, I mentioned before, I thought that they they were, all right, we're feeling good about them getting up into 5-6, winning a first-round series. Now, now I'm not so sure. <laughs> now I'm not so sure they're going to get up to 5-6. I was very confident in that seven-game win streak that they were going to get to 5 or 6. Now, they're still only a game back. They're a game back from the Kings. They're two games back from the Pelicans. But they've got that weird tiebreaker with them. They got to win games in their division. They're a game back from the Suns, and they have the tiebreaker against them. That's a good one. Suns have kind of imploded a little bit here too. But this, the whole that whole group, the Kings are the Pelicans are six and four in their last ten. Kings are five and five. Suns are five and five. Mavs are six and four. Mavs could have made up some ground in this in this last little stretch here, but they didn't. Are we overreacting to the last couple of losses? Depends. I don't think I was. I think I, I think it just recalculated what we think this Mavs team is. They still have issues. They still have problems. They're still going to lose games because of coaching. And so we'll talk about that coming up. Why are the Mavericks losing games because of coaching? Is that fair to, to say? 
Uh, what what does that mean going forward? And uh, this question I got over the last 21 games of the season, what do you think would have to transpire for Kid to lose his job? I'll tell you what it is coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is helping every single one of you and should be helping every single one of you work through things in life. If you don't go to therapy, I highly recommend it. I think everybody has something in your life that you can talk to a therapist about. You've got something in your life that is a trauma or something you just got to work through and anxiety. If you've got any anxiety at all, honestly, and I don't know how you've made it this far into 2024 without having anxiety. If you've got it, talk to somebody about it. It's worth it. I go to therapy. I've been going to therapy weekly recently and it just helped me. I had to up it. I used to go monthly and then all of a sudden I, you know, had some things happen in my life and I was like, all right, I got to, I got to up it. And so I started to go weekly and it just helps. It helps you work through things in your life to talk through, to have somebody unbiased there. And I've used better help before. Um, so sometimes all we need to do to have is the opportunity to get something off your chest. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team losing four out of five games. And it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. Wow, I can't believe the copy said that. I can't believe that. I just read the copy says four out of five. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give better help a try. It's entirely online designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule and all that. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on NBA. Thanks everybody for hanging out with us on Lockdown Maps, being part of the show, part of the Raccoon Squad, listening every day. We appreciate each and every one of you. Again, these questions are all coming from subtext. Subscribe to the subtext. It helps support the show, pays a little extra, uh, and then you can, you know, you'll get extra stuff as well, bonus content. I do a film review after every, pretty much every game. I'll do a mailbag like I did today where I'll answer some more questions and things like that. I can respond one-on-one. It's all sent to your phone. Super easy. Subscribe to that. Also check out our Lockdown Sports Dallas 24-7 stream on YouTube and Amazon Fire. 24-7, your sports teams that you love in Dallas or around the area and national shows as well on there. All right, Isaac, let's get into some more of these questions. Got a couple more questions about Jason Kidd and things like that. I'll talk about why what one thing could happen to get Jason Kidd fired. Uh, a couple of Mavs news points, though, over the last couple of days. A.J. Lawson was signed for the last roster spot. So for all those people asking about buy, buyout market and players and that, and should it be Marcus Morris and all that, that's gone. A.J. Lawson is now signed to the last roster spot. I'm excited for A.J. Lawson. I think that that's great for him to finally get you know, an actual spot in the NBA, even though it's the last 21 games or so. I don't have much hope that kid's going to play him. I mean, we've been asking for Omax, and he's like a perfect fit for what the Mavericks need. They need a bigger wing that can defend and things like that, and they haven't gone to him. They haven't even gone to Jaden Hardy, so I don't think that Lawson's going to play very much at all. I've seen some things, some people say things like, oh, his defense will help. I don't know. I have I have very vivid memories of, of kid actually trying AJ Lawson and Anthony Edwards and De'Aaron Fox just like calling his number and hunting AJ Lawson like one-on-one and losing very badly so I'm not sure that he's the defensive answer we're looking for but happy for him in his career and you know he's 23 he's going to turn 24 this summer he still can keep growing and his three-point shot has to come around a little bit more it hasn't been that great in either the G League or the NBA this season and that's really got to come around before he can get any real time with the Mavs at all that means a two-way spot was opened up. So A.J. Lawson signed right after the, the Sixers game the other day. And then a two-way spot was opened up because A.J. Lawson got signed. Alex Fudge, he used to play for the South Bay Lakers, the Lakers G League team. He played for LSU in Florida in college. He was signed to a two-way spot. He is an uber athletic. I mean, go look at, just look, search Alex Fudge dunk. He had this crazy dunk in college, dunked over a seven-footer. It's almost like the Vince Carter dunked over the guy in the Olympics. <laughs> dunk. I mean, this guy can get up. Doesn't shoot the three that well. Uh, Doesn't have any like defensive accolades in college or anything like that. So you're looking, he's, you know, he's an uber athletic guy. We're looking at him. He's kind of like a, uh, a Derek Jones Jr. type that the Mavericks are, are just bringing in. And I don't expect him to play very much either, but we'll see how he does going forward. Lucas technical foul that he got against the Sixers was also rescinded. He has 13. Now he was at 14. You get 16 and you get suspended. So he's got three more left that he can get this season. And they've really got to, they've really got to, they've really got to figure that out. We got a question about that from somebody that said, um, do you think that the refs penalize uh, the the Mavs team because they're tired of Lucas complaining? I honestly do. I don't have any numbers to back that up. I don't have any info. I don't have anything like that. I just think that they do. I think the refs look at the Mavs and go, oh, here we go. Here we go with this guy again. That, that Philly tech was so soft, so soft. I think, t- I think, they just get sick of hearing him all the time because honestly, it's a lot. 
I'm at games. I'm watching him. I'm seeing him talk to refs and I'm seeing him, you know, I, I, like, I sit and watch him between plays and be, in timeouts. And when the, you know, the commercials are playing and you're watching the rooms to go lounge, like Luca is still going at them sometimes. And every time he doesn't get that little body bump foul, he drives to the rim and he tries to finish. He doesn't get that little body bump foul. Every time he doesn't get one of those, he just screams at a ref screams at him. I mean, it's, it's a lot from Luca. So I think there's blame on both sides. I think the refs are, are sensitive and I think they're soft. And I think that Luca screams and yells too much. So both sides, but the Mavs are the ones paying for it. And I don't think Luca's getting any benefit from it at all. All right, let's get into the more, some more questions. Jason kid over the last 21 games of the season. What do you think would have to transpire for kid to be fired? Here's my answer. The Mavs right now are seven games ahead of Utah for the 11th spot. So if the Jazz make up that ground and the Mavs miss the play-in, I think Jason Kidd will be fired. I don't think there's any way you can miss two years in a row with Luka Doncic and keep your job. I think that's the, I think that's the one thing that could happen that would be the automatic firing. Cuban and the Dumont family and the Adelson family and all the Las Vegas money and all the Sands in the world would look at it and say, you know what? <laughs> I don't think we can do this anymore. I don't think it's Luca. I think it's you. I think that would have to happen. Seven games. That's a really, that's a really high thing to try and like ask of the jazz who have not played very well. They're two and eight in their last 10. So I don't think that's going to happen. So outside of that, I think even if they lose in like game one or two of the play in, so let's say they're even like ninth or 10th and they lose the first game of the play in. Sadly, I think there's enough excuses. Well, Depends who you are, sadly. I'll say sadly or luckily, depending on what you think about this. There are enough excuses that they could bring that Nico and Cuban and all them could bring to the table. Oh, you know, they, they, they dealt with so many injuries this year. Oh, we got these new players and they're still trying to bring them into the fold. Oh, you know what? The ball just wasn't bouncing for us in this one game. The three just wasn't going down. You know, we got this rookie center and all that blah, 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 blah. I think all those excuses would start coming out of the woodwork, and I think they would keep Kid. Oh, Luke and Kyrie love Kid. I mean, Kyrie it was his favorite player growing up. Sometimes I wonder how much that is true because he gets asked about that an awful lot, and you're like, "Is that really? True? Is he really your favorite player growing up as a kid, or was he just like one of your favorite players?" Like I have, I have a poster, or I had a poster with Kid on it in my room growing up, but it wasn't because of Jason Kidd. It was because there was like. Because Shaq was on it and Kevin Garnett was on it and Allen Iverson was on it and there's like a bunch of them on it, but Kid happened to be on it. So if I, but if all of a sudden I said, you know, let's say I'm a player in the NBA, I go, you know, I had a poster with Kid on it in, in my room. Everybody would run with that, right? Like, what a great story that is. I wonder about that with Kyrie. I don't think he'd ever tell us the truth either. But I don't buy that. I don't buy all the excuses at this point because I just don't think the Kid is elevating this team. And so that's what brings me into this point, into this, into this spot. Are we overreacting to kid? Are we overreacting to the fire kid? Get rid of him. There's a lot of people saying that frustrated with where, what kid has brought to the team. This has been my mentality with a lot of, with, with, with co just coaches in general in the NBA. I think there are only certain coaches that elevate your team. I think you have your Spolstras, your Popoviches. I think you have your, you know, your Phil Jackson's. I think you have those kind of coaches that your Ty Lue's, your Nick Nurses. I think you have your tacticians that, Elevate a team, a Rick Carlisle even, that can look at a team and elevate them if they're if they're willing to. I don't know if Carlisle was willing to. If they're willing to. And then I think you have some coaches, Darvin Ham, I think you have uh, probably Chauncey Billups, that hold your team back. I think it's all, I think it's like a bell curve, right? You you know a bell curve graph where there's it starts low on one side and in the middle there's all the numbers and then at the other end of the, the bell curve there's you know all the, the other numbers on the end. I think there's a small number of coaches that elevate a team and a small number of coaches that hold the team back and actively do that. And I think there's a bunch of coaches in the I think the majority of coaches are in the middle, just hanging out. I think Mark Degnold is another coach that's on the top end that he elevates a team. You look at what that Thunder team has done. And so I think Jason Kidd waffles between right in the middle of the bell curve and towards the end of the bell curve. I think there are games where you look at it and go, man, we just, w just wish you had a coach that cared about X, Y, and Z. And Jason Kidd does not care about X, Y, and Z. Motivating players. I don't think he cares about um, ca like calling plays in the sense that like running an offense that is not just through Luka and Kyrie. And you wonder about those things. Ah, maybe, maybe. I don't think he cares about... I don't think he cares about... Um, yeah, I get it's it's mostly just the motivating players, the 
offensive scheme and things like that. And it's the, uh, you know, going like completely going away from guys that have worked in the past and going away from veterans for sure. He, he has gone away from Tim Hardaway Jr. Though he's pulled those levers. Tim only played four minutes in the second half against the Sixers. And trying new things or being willing to try new things, I think is something that Jason Kidd does not necessarily care about either that much. He's tried a bunch of starting lineups. He's tried a bunch of, of guys here and there, but like once he sees somebody for a little while, he sees an Omax and he's like, all right, I think I know what Omax is. And it doesn't try him again. I don't know. He could be right. He could be right about that. Coming up, let's get into some more questions. I got a bunch of other random questions that you've got. And I also want to talk about the starting five. I mentioned that earlier. Let's talk about the starting five. The Mavs have, the Mavs have actually found one. What's working with it. We'll talk about that and more coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel Sportsbook has all kinds of props and odds that you can check out to get in the game. And if you put down $5, you can get $150 in bonus bets if your $5 bet wins. And that's on anything. Let's see. They have they have no Dallas Mavericks odds right now. So, at least for games right now. Uh, has, Luka's, has Luka's MVP? It's changed a little bit. He was at like plus 500 at one point. Now he's at plus 800. Jokic is minus 150. SGA is plus 220. They've definitely elevated themselves here. Giannis, plus 1,400. He's really fallen back in this. So, Luka for MVP, still up there. I'm not feeling so great about it now because of where the Mavericks are. I think Luka, sadly, I think Luka also probably lost MVP in this four out of five game losing streak because that's how close it was on the edge. If the Mavericks had just kept winning or at least had won, even won like two out of four in that road trip, like even won two more games out of this, then I think maybe his, his chances are still live, but it's just such a long shot. So, Check out FanDuel, though, FanDuel.com slash locked on. It's not just NBA. You've got all kinds of other stuff, too. They've got co- they've got women's basketball as well, so you can check out some Caitlin Clark stuff. I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff for Iowa. Check it out, FanDuel.com slash locked on. Uh-oh, guess what day it is? Guess what day it is, huh? Anybody? All right, Isaac, let's talk about the starting five. The Mavericks have found a starting five. They found one. I'm excited because it took them a while this season. And and I think that there's I think somebody just posted a meme with a with a polar bear and I did not get it. I think that there is um I think that this is one of the like good things coming out of this bad stretch here. Is the Mavericks have found a five man unit that actually works. The Mavericks struggled. Their their starting five to start the season was Luka Doncic, Kyrie Irving, Derek Jones Jr., Grant Williams. Remember that guy? Derek Lively. They played 99 minutes together total. They had an offensive rating of 108.7 points scored per 100 possessions. That's terrible. That 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 offensive rating is like you're being defended by the Timberwolves every single possession for the season. That's really bad because that's what the Timberwolves defensive rating is. You're playing against the toughest defense every night. Their defense rating was 111. That's actually pretty good. But their net rating was negative 2.3. That, that off that with Luca and Kyrie, you just couldn't like even with an, a lineup with Luca and Kyrie in it, you couldn't score. That off that lineup was just terrible. And so that was the starting lineup the 12 of the first 15 games of the season. This lineup that the Mavericks have been throwing out now, Luca, Kyrie, Josh Green, PJ Washington, Derek Lively, they've played just 72 minutes together in about like six games, I think. Offensive rating 133.3, which is insane. 100 percentile, like super high, 133 points scored per 100 possessions. Remember the the one that didn't work was 108 points per 100 possessions. It's a big difference. Great offense. Defense, 112.9 points per 100 possessions. You'll take that. That's about average right now in the NBA. Actually, for, for a team, that would be top 10, like I mentioned earlier. But still, great. You, you love that. You'll take that. Net rating, plus 20. Those are their outscoring teams by 20 points per 100 possessions. That's a great five-man unit. I think they finally found what their five-man unit can do. And I think it works because Josh Green and P.J. Washington are just good enough threats both off the dribble, huge, off the dribble and spot-up shooting that it allows guys to have to decide, all right, am I going to just help off of P.J. Washington this whole game? Am I just going to help off of Josh Green this whole game? And then Derek Lively provides the lob threat, which they had at the beginning of the season, but he's better player right now than he was at the beginning of the season. And so... Luca and Kyrie or Luca and Derek Lively have connected on more lobs than anybody else in the NBA this season. It's just something that's really helped this team push them forward and all that. The starting five is working. They found that they're going to stick with it. I've, I can hear, I can hear Derek Jones Jr. Instead of Josh Green, 
because of his defense. I think that Derek Jones Jr. did a much better job on Tyrese Maxey in the fourth quarter of the last game than Josh Green did throughout the first three quarters of the game. I could hear that. Josh Green just doesn't, he doesn't navigate screens as well. You need somebody. You need a Reggie Bullock. You need a Derek Jones Jr. You need somebody like that to navigate screens. It's just a, it's a hard thing in the NBA. You've got to learn how to be agile and move throughout. And you've got to have the length to catch up. And Josh Green just doesn't have that kind of like elite length. He's 6'5". Doesn't have a huge wingspan. He's quick, but he also takes a, he takes like the long path around around the screens too. If you ever see him go around a screen, somebody will set a screen and it's like he doesn't want to touch them as he goes as he goes around them. That's kind of a weird thing too. He doesn't get foul calls on those a lot and he wants to get them. And so maybe that has deterred him from trying to create any contact going through those screens. But it's something that they've struggled with. And if the Mavericks want to win a title, they've got to find an elite point of attack defender. Their next step really is lively to get better. PJ Washington to get more comfortable in offense and to change the Josh Green role into a Herb Jones, an OG Ananobi, a somebody like that that's like, oh, you're locking down your spot. That's what they need. They really, really need that. Especially considering who their backcourt is. Luka and Kyrie can both be solid in their roles, but you don't want them defending. You want somebody that can be able to, to hang on an island and you don't have to worry about them. If they could get Herb Jones this summer, that would be just the big, that would be the biggest thing ever. Or if Omax becomes that guy. I don't think he's going to be good enough offensively for them to. And, it, and I was looking at Iztok Franco. He's got some good stuff on Twitter all the time. And he works for or D Magazine. But he was pointing out some of Omax's steals and blocks and things like that. He just doesn't, just doesn't generate enough deflections like he should in college or right now in what he's played in the NBA. I'm watching that. so I'm not. But I'm not, like, expecting him to step into that role. It would be awesome if he could. But they need somebody like that. They need, a, they need a really good point of attack defender that has length that would really just solidify that lineup. And then all of a sudden, if Lively can take a step forward next year, then you're talking about a title contender. That'd be huge. If they keep the same depth too, you got to keep that. You probably also got to add a third score somehow. <laughs> they've got some things that they've got some things to do. A couple other questions. Let's just get to some of these other ones. I only got one question about Tim Hardaway Jr. I was very proud of you guys. <laughs> I was very proud of all the Subdeck subscribers. I only got one. How badly is Tim Hardaway Jr. hurting his offensive trade value this season? I don't think that teams look at a 10-game sample size and go, you know what, I think this guy sucks. I think they know what he is, right? I mean, he was he was pretty good to start the season. He had some real, don't, don't let the recency bias affect you because I think Tim Hardaway Jr. played pretty well to start the season. He's going to do Tim Hardaway Jr. things. He's going to take ridiculous shots, but he was at least hitting some of those shots. Now he's not at all. Not hitting any of those shots. And he's taking terrible shots. His, his like, yeah, yeah. His his shot selection has gotten worse. His decision-making has gotten worse. I think Tim Cato put it best the other day when he goes, he's a streaky player, but I've never seen him this streaky. He's a player that makes questionable decisions, and I've never seen him t- make more questionable decisions than he is right now. Like, it just is all coming to a head for Tim Hardaway Jr. It's just not coming together for him at all. But to start the season, first 46 games, 18 points a game, from three. And remember, he takes ridiculous shots. So that three-point percentage is not going to be the 40, 41% that you want. And his assist to turnover ratio was positive. Since then, you look in like some of his recent games. I mean, let's look. It's the last 12 games. Nine points a game on 30% from the, from three. And his assist to turnover ratio, it's about the same. It's gotten, it's gotten better last couple of games. He had four assists the other day. But it's just been bad. But I don't think that a team will look at a 10-game sample size and go, man, this, this guy is just bad. The other thing about Tim Hardaway Jr., the positive thing about his trade value is going to be he's an expiring contract. <laughs> That's what teams are going to look at and say, oh, we can have this guy. He's kind of functional, but also we don't have to pay him for very much longer. And he's an expiring contract, and that's what's going to make him valuable. So I wouldn't take, oh, man, is his play going to make the Maverick can't trade him? Well, they've been trying to trade him anyway. But I think now that he's going to be an expiring contract, I think it'll make him a little bit more uh, desirable at that, at that point. What other questions did I get? I get a lot of questions about the avatar show. I've watched six out of eight episodes so far. I'm really taking my time. The show means a lot to me. I've watched six out of eight episodes. I'll only, I'll, I'll say this episode six, the one with the mask, the mask one. I got the mask like right there. The blue, the blue spirit mask. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. So if you're like, ugh, you watch the first couple of episodes and you go, I didn't really like this. At least watch that one and see if you like it. If you don't like that one, then I don't think you're going to like this show. But watch that one. Excellent episode. They took a lot of stuff just straight from the show. Some of them line by line. 
But I love that. Sh- I love that episode. I was just, I'm probably going to watch that again. You know, when you watch a show and then you're like, I could watch that one episode again. There's so many, there's, there's a bunch of shows like that where you're like, oh, that one episode though. I want to just go back. That's one where I'm like, ah, just, I want to watch it again. So that's a good sign. I'll finish it up and I'll probably do a long thing on like TikTok or something where I'll, I'll give my full thoughts on the show because I have a lot and I've been asked my bad and asked about them by you guys several times and I appreciate that. There you go. Tomorrow, I'll be back talking Mavs versus, let's see who they got next. They've got Mavs versus the Pacers. That's a home game. So Slightly and I will be back Wednesday. I'll be back as well talking Mavs and then Thursday against the Heat, the Mavs have a home game. So we'll have that, me and Slightly will have that covered as well. Guys, thanks so much for listening to Locked on Mavs. Peace out. Boom. Boom.